Evelyn harbored a deep-seated desire to unravel the mysteries of her own origins. A longing that eclipsed all other aspirations in her life. Having spent her earliest years in an orphanage, she had no memories of her biological parents. Some of the staff members had occasionally whispered about how she was found as a toddler. Abandoned at a bustling railway station with no form of identification or personal items that could provide clues to her familial roots. The sole item she possessed was a unique pendant shaped like a miniature silver key. Which she always wore around her neck. Despite extensive efforts by the police to trace the origins of this unusual necklace. Including visiting numerous jewelry stores throughout Chicago. The search proved fruitless. The circumstances of why and how Evelyn was left at the station remained enshrouded in mystery. A prevailing theory among the caregivers, which Evelyn reluctantly came to accept as her own narrative, suggested that her parents might have been struggling with alcoholism and found themselves incapable of providing her the care she needed, choosing perhaps in desperate hopelessness to leave her at the station. Life in the orphanage was challenging. Marked by the harsh reality of being overlooked by potential adoptive families. While other children found new homes. Evelyn grew up within the institution's walls. Often enveloped in a quiet sorrow. Thinking to herself. I guess no one wants me. As she transitioned into adulthood and left the orphanage which had become more of a home than she would have liked. Evelyn managed to secure employment promptly. She became a cleaning lady at a trading company. A position she embraced with enthusiasm and skill. A testament to the diligent work ethic instilled in her by her caregivers. The company was under the leadership of Alfred Morrison. A compassionate and forward-thinking executive who valued each of his employees dearly. Evelyn held great respect for Mr. Morrison, whose rare but meaningful interactions with her were always cherished, despite his frequent business travels. In the absence of Mr. Morrison, the day-to-day -day operations were overseen by the deputy director, George Brown, a man as critical as he was demanding, often unfairly so. Evelyn learned to navigate around Mr. Brown's abrasive demeanor, minimizing their interactions to maintain her peace of mind. On one particularly stormy morning, an incident at the office would test Evelyn's resolve and inadvertently set her on a path that might just lead her towards the answers she sought about her origins. Evelyn had been diligently seeking answers about her heritage when the need for regular upkeep called her attention to the lobby floor which demanded frequent cleaning due to its tendency to collect mud and dirt. As she was about to replace the murky water in her mop bucket, the entrance doors burst open, and George Brown made his entrance. His eyes immediately caught the unkempt state of the floor, and his face contorted into a frown of displeasure. In a tone laden with irritation, he demanded, why is this lobby always in such disarray? Can't you clean it properly with a cloth? His voice escalated as he addressed the deputy director nearby. Quick to respond. Evelyn apologized. I'm sorry. Mr. Brown. I'll have it cleaned immediately. She moved quickly. Trying to dissolve the growing tension. But George, already agitated, seemed intent on directing his frustrations at her. The unsuspecting janitor became an easy scapegoat for his irritation. So consumed by his irritation, George failed to notice when his harsh words crossed a line, reducing Evelyn to tears. In the midst of this distressing interaction, Evelyn struggled to maintain her composure and prevent the situation from escalating further. Just then, a firm yet calm voice intervened. Mr. Brown, 
What is happening here? Why are you treating your staff this way? George spun around to see Alfred Morrison. The director. Who had returned unexpectedly early from a business trip. Surprised. George attempted to defend his actions. Excuse me. Sir. I was just ensuring everything was in order. But this cleaner. His voice trailed off as he hesitated. Alfred responded sternly. Don't you dare speak about Evelyn in that tone. She is as much an employee here as you are, before he strode into his office. At that moment, Evelyn found the courage to quietly express her thanks. Thank you. Sir. I really appreciate your support. The director offered a reassuring smile to the cleaning lady. As he turned to leave, he noticed a small shiny object around her neck, a silver pendant shaped like a key, which had slipped out from under her uniform and now glistened under the fluorescent lights. Alfred's heart skipped a beat, and his eyes welled up with tears as he recognized the pendant. Noticing his altered demeanor, Evelyn inquired, Is something wrong? Sir? Visibly shaken and sweating, Alfred inquired with a trembling voice. Excuse me. But where did you get this pendant? Evelyn. Feeling somewhat relieved to be shifting the conversation away from the earlier conflict. Replied. I don't know. Sir. The revelation of the pendant triggered a cascade of memories in Alfred. Connecting his present to a past he had no knowledge of. The pendant that Evelyn now held had been with her since she was found abandoned at a busy station in Chicago. This detail shook Alfred to his core. As he grappled with the implications of their intertwined fates. I've had this pendant ever since I can remember, Evelyn explained. Her voice tinged with curiosity and a trace of sadness. The staff at the orphanage mentioned that it was with me when I was discovered at the Chicago station as a newborn. Upon hearing this, Alfred Morrison's face drained of color. He stepped back, his voice barely above a whisper. No. That's impossible. The shock seemed to immobilize him momentarily. As the air around seemed to thicken with tension. As Alfred's mind raced through the corridors of his past, he remembered the secure and nurturing environment his parents had provided. Growing up in a household brimming with love and support, Alfred had flourished in his studies, excelling particularly in mathematics and sciences. This academic excellence had paved the way for him to attend a prestigious university where he pursued an economics degree with the ambition of making a mark in the business world. His prowess in the classroom was matched by his rapid rise to prominence among his peers. Alfred's capacity for academic work also afforded him the opportunity to partake in various extracurricular activities. He became the quarterback for his university's football team. Skillfully managing the demands of this challenging role alongside his rigorous academic schedule. It was during his time at university that Alfred met Gina, a vibrant member of the cheerleading team. Their connection was immediate and profound, quickly evolving into a deep and passionate relationship. Their love blossomed swiftly, and within months, driven partly by the joyful news of Gina's pregnancy, they decided to marry. This union was not only a testament to their love, but also a shared commitment to their forthcoming responsibilities as parents. Following his graduation, Alfred easily secured a job in his field, thanks to his impressive academic achievements. However, the early days of their marriage were overshadowed by Gina's taxing pregnancy, which included severe morning sickness and bouts of dizziness. Despite these hurdles, the birth of their daughter Evelyn went remarkably smoothly. 
bringing a beautiful and healthy baby girl into their lives. Evelyn was a serene and joyful child. Her presence a constant source of happiness for her parents. She slept soundly through the nights. Providing Alfred and Gina with much-needed rest amidst their new parenting duties. On her first birthday, Alfred presented Evelyn with a silver pendant shaped like a small key. A symbolic gesture of his undying love and devotion to her. This gift warmed the hearts of everyone present. Further binding the family together. Yet. The unforeseen revelation about the pendant threatened to unravel the fabric of their seemingly secure happiness. Casting a shadow of mystery and uncertainty over their future. On that sunny day in June. Alfred had embarked on what was meant to be a delightful train journey to Chicago with his three-year-old daughter Evelyn. Aiming to introduce her to the pleasures of travel and ensure her comfort. As they traveled through the picturesque landscapes of Illinois. Evelyn was mesmerized by the world unfolding outside the train window. Her eyes sparkling with wonder and curiosity. Unfortunately. Gina. Alfred's wife. Was unable to accompany them due to illness. A decision she would later deeply regret as she realized the magnitude of the events she missed. Unbeknownst to them. This trip was about to take a dramatic turn that would alter their lives forever. At a quaint rural station along their route, three suspicious-looking young men boarded their train. These individuals were not ordinary passengers but were opportunistic thieves who made a living by preying on vulnerable travelers. Alfred, with his distinguished and affluent appearance, became their target. Despite being in the company of his daughter, the thieves patiently waited for an opportunity to strike. When Alfred momentarily stepped away from their coach, the thieves followed him, attacked him brutally, and threw him from the moving train. Back in the train car, young Evelyn remained seated, blissfully unaware of the peril her father was facing. It was not until their arrival in Chicago that the grim reality became apparent, Alfred was missing. Leaving Evelyn alone and vulnerable in the bustling train station of the city. A disheveled woman with seemingly ill intentions approached her. But alert police officers nearby intervened in time. Ensuring her safety. They escorted Evelyn to a police station and later placed her in an orphanage in Chicago until further arrangements could be made. Meanwhile, Alfred was fighting for his life in an intensive care unit, suffering from a severe brain injury that left him in a coma. Back at home, Gina was overwhelmed with anxiety and desperation as she frantically searched for her husband and daughter. It took three excruciating days before she located Alfred in the hospital. But by then, he was in no condition to assist in locating their daughter. As the police continued their investigation and the family grappled with these tragic events, the community rallied around them, offering support and hoping for Alfred's recovery and a swift reunion with his daughter I in their quest to locate their daughter Evelyn. Alfred and Gina Morrison encountered significant obstacles. Primarily because Evelyn was too young at the time of her disappearance to provide any details about herself beyond her name. At the orphanage where she was taken in, the staff members warmly referred to her simply as Evelyn. It was not until after a painstaking six months that Alfred emerged from a coma and was able to explain the events that had transpired. By then, the perpetrators responsible for her disappearance had been apprehended. But they disclosed no information about her whereabouts. As time went on, Alfred managed to heal from his physical injuries. Though the emotional trauma of losing his daughter continued to haunt him. Gina. Affected by health issues that prevented her from having more children. Felt the loss of her only child even more acutely. Initially, 
the couple dedicated themselves fully to the search for Evelyn. Over time. However, they were forced to confront the harsh likelihood that they might never find her and began to focus their efforts on building their own business. By their late 40s, they had successfully established a company that provided them with financial stability. Throughout his life, Alfred was frequently haunted by memories of the tragic trip that changed their family forever. His heart raced one day when he noticed a cleaning lady in his office wearing a pendant identical to one his daughter had owned. The woman, intriguingly also named Evelyn, had a distinctive mole above her upper lip, a detail Alfred had overlooked until that moment. His paternal instincts surged. And he became convinced that she was his long-lost daughter. Alfred approached Evelyn gently and led her to his office. Where he shared the heartbreaking story he had kept to himself for so many years. Evelyn was shocked. Barely able to grasp the possibility that their meeting was more than mere coincidence. Alfred. However. Felt a profound certainty about their connection and promptly arranged for a DNA test to confirm their relationship. Hopeful it would prove she was indeed his daughter who had vanished years earlier. The confirmation that Evelyn was his daughter brought immense joy to Gina and rippled through their family and friends. The reunion between mother and daughter was profoundly emotional. Moving everyone who witnessed it to tears. Overwhelmed with relief and happiness. Alfred vowed to ensure Evelyn's well-being for the rest of his life. Such challenging times underscore the invaluable support of family and close friends. A week after the poignant reunion, Alfred Morrison took decisive action to ensure his family would never be torn apart again. Reinforcing the bonds that had been tested but ultimately endured through their ordeal. At his company. He made a decisive leadership change by terminating the deputy director and promoting Evelyn to fill the role. Evelyn. Inheriting her father's astute business acumen. Swiftly adjusted to her new responsibilities. The company's employees. Who had not been particularly fond of her predecessor. George. Received her leadership warmly. They felt a renewed sense of confidence in the future of the company with her at the forefront. Now deeply immersed in her new position. Evelyn treasured every moment she spent with her parents. Who had previously been mere figures in her dreams but were now a tangible part of her daily life. After listening to this tale, what are your impressions? We'd love to hear from you in the comments section below. Your insights are valuable to us, now, we have another engaging story, let's proceed to the next one, after spending a few more minutes in conversation, I noticed the smile slowly fading from the faces of my husband and mother-in-law, Laura, are you okay, my husband asked, his voice tinged with a note of impatience, what? It's nothing. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was hiding something, suddenly, my mother-in-law stood up with a grimace, ouch. Oh. She quickly excused herself and rushed towards the bathroom, clutching her stomach in obvious distress. Mom, what's wrong? My husband called after her. Why must I suffer this stomach pain? She groaned as she disappeared into the bathroom. This can't be happening. My husband muttered under his breath. Laura, you didn't switch the tea, did you? He turned to me with a puzzled look. I did, along with your mother, I replied. A bit confused by his question, why would you do that? What's wrong with switching it? My name is Laura, I'm a 30-year-old office worker, Joshua, my husband, and I have been married for two years, we met at the company where I work, he was initially a mid-career hire from one of our clients and seemed a bit out of place at first, by the time of our second meeting, he seemed more settled and confident, I was drawn to his sharp mind and intellectual approach, as we spent more time together. Attending dinners and evening outings, our relationship deepened. He eventually opened up about his feelings, and we started dating officially, 
things moved swiftly from there, he proposed, we married, and our life as newlyweds started off quite blissfully, in our household, Joshua isn't much of a cook, so I took on all the culinary duties, while he handled the cleaning and laundry, he also managed the trash disposal, which was a great help, however. I've noticed a change in his behavior towards me recently, in the past, he was exceedingly attentive. Always dotting around me and seeking my attention at home, it was almost like training a puppy, where I had to constantly ask him for patience, but lately, he hasn't been as affectionate, his once warm and engaging tone has become distant and formal, what's for dinner? It's hamburger, your favorite. Okay. His tepid response didn't reflect the effort I put into preparing his favorite meal, even after serving it, his reaction was subdued, as if his interest in both the meal and me had waned, he had been so caring initially, I hoped he would return to that loving demeanor, not only my husband, but also my mother-in-law has been a source of stress, since the beginning of our marriage, she has been quite critical of me. Hey Laura, why didn't you prepare snacks? I'm sorry. But your visits are always so unexpected, normally, I would have something ready. That's impossible. Up until recently, my husband would defend me against my mother-in-law's criticisms, however, of late, he has begun to side with her, aligning with her critiques of me, I truly believe that this isn't reasonable, a wife should not always be expected to be prepared for her mother-in-law's visits, especially when they are unplanned, whenever my mother visits, it's unpredictable and I might have to change plans abruptly due to your sudden arrivals. My husband often brings up the topic of divorce whenever he perceives my behavior as problematic, this shift in his demeanor distresses me, as he was never like this in the past, despite the sorrow this stirs in me, I still hold on to the hope that I can trust him, then, recently, an unexpected event occurred, one weekend, my mother-in-law came to visit, bringing with her some fancy tea and a selection of sweets, seemingly in good spirits and ready to enjoy a pleasant afternoon. Eager to make a good impression, I too had gone out of my way to purchase some of the finest tea available, let's enjoy it together, she proposed cheerfully, I couldn't help but wonder about her sudden generosity, questioning if there might be a hidden agenda behind her actions, my husband, joining in, thanked his mother and took it upon himself to prepare the tea, a task he usually doesn't partake in, hurry and set the table, my mother is waiting, he urged me. Displaying an uncharacteristic burst of enthusiasm, while I was setting the table, feeling a mix of unease and curiosity, my husband approached with a smile, handing me a cup of the freshly brewed tea, wow, this smells amazing, my mother-in-law exclaimed, taking a deep inhale from her cup, I too sniffed the tea, noticing it smelled ordinary yet there was something unusual about it, tiny bubbles floated on the surface. An anomaly for such a beverage, alarm bells rang in my head. Advising me against drinking it, though I was uncertain of my next move, then, a diversion came to mind, oh, that's right, you mentioned your favorite Korean singer was on a music show the other night, I managed to record it, you might want to watch it, I told my mother-in-law, delighted, she immediately went to fetch the remote, seizing the moment, I pointed out to my husband, you've made tea but forgot the snacks. Typically dismissive and easily annoyed, he retorted. I was just about to get to that, wait a moment, and he left to retrieve some snacks and plates, with them both temporarily away, I swiftly swapped my tea with my mother-in-law's, they returned, and we all sat down, well, let's have some tea, shall we, she suggested, as she and my husband began to sip their tea, they watched me intently, it certainly tastes different from the usual, I commented neutrally, I know, I know. It's a different blend, delicious, isn't it? My husband and mother-in-law responded, laughing a bit too heartily at my remark, Oh yes, it's good, I agreed, though my suspicions about their intentions remained, Yes, it's very good, I continued, deciding to drink all of the tea to avoid arousing further suspicion, as the conversation continued, the smiles slowly faded from their faces, Laura, are you okay, my husband finally asked, his tone laced with concern, the conversation between my husband and me was strained. His voice laced with annoyance as he questioned me, what, he asked sharply, no, nothing, I replied, sensing his underlying agitation, it was apparent he was hiding something, the tension escalated suddenly when my mother-in-law stood up sharply from her chair, ouch, she exclaimed, clutching her abdomen, what's wrong, I quickly asked, concerned, writhing in pain, she muttered, why does my stomach hurt so much? 
This isn't good, I murmured under my breath, turning to me, my husband asked in a panicked tone, Laura, you didn't mix up the teas, did you? I swapped mine with your mother's, I confessed, puzzled by his sudden concern, why would you do that, his voice rose with worry, what's the problem with switching them? I retorted, still confused, does this mean there was something harmful in the first tea you gave me, he pressed, no, it's just that, I started to say, but his expression urged me to seek the truth, tell me the truth, or you won't be able to manage the situation, and your mother will be at risk, I warned, faced with no other choice, he confessed, I had actually added a significant amount of powdered laxative to your tea. Huh, of course you'd have stomach issues if you did that, in large amounts, it could even be deadly, I realized aloud, really, call an ambulance, he cried out in a panic, okay, I replied, dialing for emergency services, that was how my mother-in-law ended up being whisked away in an ambulance, my husband, distraught and anxious, rushed to be by her side, in the meantime, I secured the tea in which my husband had mixed the laxatives, transferring it into a water bottle as evidence. I'll take this to the police and file a report, I resolved, while my husband and mother-in-law were at the hospital, I began packing my belongings and called my parents for assistance in moving out, soon, I was en route to their house, upon my arrival, my husband called, his voice filled with urgency, my mom is in danger, she's in pretty bad shape, she needs to stay in the hospital for a few days, so, I need you to bring her a change of clothes and some other essentials, okay? Surprised and frustrated, I responded, what are you talking about, of course, I don't want to do that. Hey, you can't do that, my mom's in trouble, he protested, you're my wife, you should at least do that, he added, trying to appeal to my sense of duty, I can't be with you anymore, I'm divorcing you, I declared firmly, divorce, he echoed, stunned, when I mentioned divorce, my husband fell silent for a moment before responding, I see, if you insist on divorcing me, then I don't have a choice. But you're the one who asked for the divorce, you don't get a share of the property. What are you talking about, you're the one who caused the divorce, so, I'll take what I can get, I countered sharply, don't be ridiculous, I'm not giving you a dime, the divorce was your idea, he retorted, it's not my fault, I argued back, disgusted, you're the one who tried to force me to drink a cup of laxative tea in the first place, how can you even justify that, do you really think you're not at fault here, moreover? I have gathered substantial evidence that will ensure you face consequences for your actions, I declared, before hanging up the phone, with a myriad of tasks ahead of me, such as securing legal representation, I opted to delay any further action for the moment, later on, when my husband asked why some of my items were missing from our home, he expressed his frustration about the apparent decline in the household's upkeep, attributing it to my negligence, his messages filled with selfish and unreasonable demands, continued to pour in, no, you're actually prepared to divorce me, aren't you, do you understand that once we're divorced, the entire responsibility of managing the household will fall on you, he challenged me, there were numerous issues I wanted to discuss with him, but I chose to withhold my response until I had consulted with my attorney, after my mother-in-law was discharged from the hospital. My husband and his parents paid a visit to my parents' home, visibly upset, divorce isn't the answer, but I'll go along with it, I declared resolutely, you didn't even visit my mother in the hospital after the incident, he accused, you just took your belongings and left, how can I continue being married to someone like you, he arrogantly asserted, my mother-in-law shot me a harsh glare. And it was clear that both she and my husband were presenting the situation from their biased viewpoint. As a result, my father in law, who only heard my husband's side, was inclined to believe him. Laura, I think you're being somewhat selfish, commented my father in law, the only person in my husband's family who seemed reasonable. He would obviously think so, given the one sided story he was exposed to. I then decided to reveal a piece of crucial evidence by playing an audio clip from my phone, in which I had secretly recorded a significant revelation, I had secretly added a substantial amount of powdered laxative to Laura's tea, the audio clip revealed, upon hearing this, both my husband and mother-in-law turned ashen, how did that conversation even start, my husband blurted out, effectively incriminating himself, feeling threatened, I had quickly switched my mother-in-law's tea with mine.
leading to her developing a stomach ache soon after, she had consistently harassed me, and although my husband had initially been upset with her for it, they had recently aligned against me, this was the final straw, my father-in-law, enraged upon hearing my side of the story, fixed a stern gaze on my husband and mother-in-law, hey Joshua, what's going on here, is it true that you were also harassing her? He demanded with intensity, caught off guard. My husband and mother-in-law were visibly embarrassed by his direct confrontation, no, wait, dad, it was all in good. My husband stumbled over his words, it was just for fun, Laura felt sick because I had slipped laxatives into her tea as a playful surprise, I certainly didn't mean any harm, and neither did I, it was all meant in jest. Really, you think that's just a joke, I questioned the sincerity of their humor, I'm not convinced they find it funny at all, is this really an escape, forever, is this why Joshua has been so horrible to me, I pulled out an envelope and laid its contents on the table, inside were photos of my husband's affair, obtained from a private detective agency, his face turned even paler, why, did you think I was oblivious to everything, your distant behavior raised my suspicions prompting me to hire an investigator, I never truly believed you were unfaithful, it seemed more likely you were trying to provoke me into filing for divorce, clearly, I was right, I stated as he began to sweat profusely, I then handed him the divorce papers to finalize his fate, no matter how naive you are, being presented with divorce papers makes you realize your disadvantage, doesn't it, of course. I will be entitled to alimony and a fair share of the property, oh, and by the way, I'm filing a report against you for assault due to the laxative incident, what, the police, wait a minute, don't you feel any remorse for Joshua? What are you talking about, it's not just my husband, you, my mother-in-law, are equally guilty, he was collaborating with you, wait a minute, why should I be arrested, it was Joshua who tampered with the laxatives, mom, you orchestrated this plan, don't you dare try to pin this solely on me, what, you asked me to assist you because you found a new potential wife. My husband and my mother-in-law began to argue. Neither willing to confess their wrongdoing, divorce ensued, finally, my father-in-law lost his patience and erupted, enough, you both committed a crime, admit it and accept responsibility together, don't complain when the police take you away, and Joshua, you need to accept responsibility for the affair, pay Laura the alimony she is entitled to, and she will receive your portion of the property. My husband and mother-in-law were utterly terrified by my father-in-law's stern voice. My father-in-law was the first to step in as tensions escalated, noting that my own father was on the brink of losing his temper over the situation, sensing that further confrontation would be unproductive, I calmly suggested, let's handle the rest through the lawyers, and press my husband to sign the divorce papers without delay, initially hesitant. He finally complied after receiving a firm reprimand from his father, in a solemn tone. I apologized for the distress caused by my husband and his mother, saying, I am truly sorry for the trouble my foolish son and my foolish wife have caused you. My father-in-law agreed with my sentiments and took both my husband and mother-in-law back to their home. Subsequently, I pursued alimony payments through my lawyer, successfully obtaining $30,000 each from my ex-husband and his co-adulterer. I also filed a police report against my ex-husband and ex-mother-in-law after discovering that my husband had deliberately spiked the tea with a laxative during the incident, leading to their arrest and subsequent fines. My former father-in-law, appalled by his wife's actions, left her and initiated divorce proceedings. Consequently, my former mother-in-law found herself needing to secure employment to pay her fines, as she could no longer rely on her son for financial support. She now works a part-time job with a modest income, meanwhile, my ex-husband's mistress, upset upon learning that he had misled her about their future together, confronted him, he promised to cover her alimony, which he settled in a lump sum by taking out a consumer loan, after settling her demands, the mistress disappeared, leaving my ex-husband burdened with significant debt and deserted by both her and me. A situation he had brought upon himself, on a more positive note, I achieved my goals. Securing my share of the property and finding contentment in my new circumstances, I now live alone in an apartment, focus on my career, and have recently earned a promotion, I am considering celebrating these accomplishments by planning a trip with friends or perhaps with my parents, reflecting on the whole ordeal. It's clear that intentionally inducing someone to consume tea laced with laxatives is a serious offense and no laughing matter.
The actions of my husband and his mother were reprehensible, but I am grateful that my father-in-law was a decent man who recognized the ordeal I was enduring. Despite the tumultuous events, I am hopeful for a more peaceful future. I hope you find someone truly wonderful soon. Do you have any thoughts after hearing the above two stories? We'd like to hear your thoughts. Tell us in the comments section. That's all for today's story. Please subscribe and give a thumbs up. See you next time.